My name is Paul Woosley, and I am the director of the Agriculture Research and Education Center here at Western Kentucky University, which is the part of uh, WKU's Department of Agriculture and Food Science. And so um, you're in the L.D. Brown Ag Exposition Center, but uh, AREC uh, consists of 812 acres, and we're less than four miles from campus. So um, Western uh, has been very blessed in the Agriculture and Food Science Department to be able to uh, give our students hardcore science in the classroom, but then they can use this 812-acre facility in our laboratories to apply that knowledge. But also here, part of AREC stands for research, and we do uh, do quite a bit of applied research, uh, not only in crops, but also in livestock here at this facility. And so, as David said, uh, we've been blessed to be a part of the Kentucky Hemp Pilot Program since it started. And early on, uh, one thing that we observed here at Western and around the state is that um, people that were growing hemp uh, that had failure crops, the biggest, most often cause of failure was weeds, okay? And so um, we decided to try to start uh, tackling that problem. Uh, Dr. Todd Willen was supposed to give this talk this morning. Um, he's our resident weed scientist, and uh, but uh, he had a death in the family and had a funeral he had to attend this morning, but he will be here after lunch. So if you have a question that I can't answer, or if you have some questions specific to Dr. Willem, if you'll just find me after lunch, I can get you in contact with Dr. Willem. But I'm going to go over some of the data that we've uh, collected over the past few years related to um, controlling weeds in industrial hemp. So I know a lot of hemp is being grown uh, for CBD production. Uh, here at this university, we've been focusing more on a crop model uh, for field crops and industrial hemp grown for grain. Before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, KDA for allowing us to participate in the Kentucky Hemp Pilot Program. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Williams and the University of Kentucky uh, for cooperating with us. Um, they've had some plots here at our location and they've been kind enough to let us come and uh, replicate some of our research they're in Lexington as well, and so they've been a great group to cooperate with on this project. So first off, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about our experiences. Uh, oftentimes when we plant industrial hemp out in a uh, row crop production setting, um, sometimes we end up with a crop that looks like this. And so uh, we've seen several different weed species Growing in hemp, um, the ones that tend to cause us the most problems, though, are, are pigweeds. And um, we do have some other grasses as well. Uh, I think uh, Tony down in uh, Murray, they've been battling Johnson grass some and some of their plots. So, uh, so we do have a lot of weed pressure um, for industrial hemp on a large scale row crop production system. So we've seen this. Okay, but we've also had um, some good stands. So we're trying to take a proactive approach. Um, now that industrial hemp has become federally legal, we're hoping down the road uh, that we can get pesticides label to try to control some of these weeds. And so being proactive, we want to identify some of these that might be available to farmers and so we can hopefully get them fast-tracked and labeled and out on the market to try to uh, help farmers be more successful in their establishments. Is it organic? No, no. If you put a pesticide on it, it's not organic. So, yeah. So uh, you can't use any pesticides and call your hemp organic. So uh, this might not, when we talk about pesticides, a lot of you is growing this for CBD on small scales and plastic. This may not be applicable to you, but this is more applicable to large-scale farmers that might be growing it in the future for grain production and fiber production. Okay, that being said, there are currently no pesticides labeled for industrial hemp. You cannot apply pesticides to industrial hemp farmers. 
Understand that. Okay? If that's the case, then why do we get so many calls? Hey, what have you sprayed on your hemp? Uh, and I say, well, you can't spray things on your hemp. Well, you know, just for future, what, what, what have you seen that's worked, you know? <laughs> okay? So, I will say this. Um, for the first time, we work with several different um, ag chemical companies conducting research more on corn and soybeans here at the university. Um, but for the first time this year, we've had a couple of them uh, contact us and request some data. Uh, so the passing of the federal farm bill has started to spur some interest with some of these ag chemical companies. So hopefully we'll be able to conduct even more funded research uh, in the future. All right, so our approach has been, hey, let's plant some hemp and let's look at all the different herbicides we have on tap and apply them to industrial hemp and see which ones might control industrial hemp, uh, which is not a good thing if you're trying to grow it, and which ones are safe on industrial hemp but hopefully will control some weeds. All right, early on in the hemp pilot program, a lot of people that were uh, kind of opposed to industrial hemp being legalized in the state was the main, one of the main reasons was is that uh, hemp is going to become this noxious weed that grows everywhere. Well, trust me, there's lots of herbicides that kill hemp. We found that out. We've done a great job at controlling hemp with different herbicides, okay? So I don't think that's going to be an issue, all right? But uh, these are some of the many uh, different herbicides that we looked at on industrial hemp. And so not only looking at many different numerous herbicides, but we've looked at several different modes of action. So, um, group two are some ALS inhibitors, and this group would be some post-emergent applications. And um, then we have some pre-emergents, uh, group 15, uh, group three, and group 14 has pre-emergent and some uh, post-emergent activity as well, or residual activity. And then we've also looked at um, group 27, these are commonly referred to as bleachers. They turn weeds really bright and white. Um, so we looked at some of those as well. And then several others down here. Uh, MSMA is a really old herbicide that's um, slowly being phased out, but um, fusillade. Um, so some other ones as well. So we screened all these at some point in time in, in certain type of research trials. And so um, most of our research has occurred here at uh, AREC, and so um, we utilize conventional no tillage. We have silt loam so soils, and we're seeding around 30 pounds of seed per acre on small plots, and we'll use these research um, plot sprayers to apply different herbicides to our, to our trials. All these have been replicated, and Pre-emergent herbicides are sprayed the day of planting, so we'll plant the industrial hemp, apply a pre-emergent herbicide, and we try to time that um, right after, uh, right before rain is coming, or if it's been extremely dry, we'll water that in. We haven't had that problem here lately, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so most of the time, Mother Nature has watered those in for us. Our post-emergent uh, applications, we try to target hemp between 8 and 20 inches tall. All right, and then we've been looking at crop injury and, and yield. Okay, so, uh, let's see, did I see Robbie back there somewhere? Robbie Anderson in here? No, he was stepped out. All right, that's okay. I'll get somebody else. I'll work the lights the rest of the day. Um, but uh, this is just an aerial view of some of our herbicide research, and you can see, obviously, some um, herbicides drastically affect industrial hemp and uh, actually control it. Others show uh, little phytotoxicity on the crop. Over the five years, um, some other observations as we've noticed is that we get different emergent patterns of the hemp that we plant. We can have some varieties that will uh, merge pretty quickly, but then later on there's delayed emergence and some of the other seed. And so you end up with hemp that may be three or four inches tall, and then you end up with hemp that's a, you know two weeks behind. 
Other times, um, they all emerge pretty uh, along the same time, and you get a uniform stand. And then this happens from time to time as well. Um, hemp will not tolerate flooding, okay? All right, it, it, so do not plant it in an area that's prone to flood. It's, you know, corn's more tolerant than hemp. I mean, it just, it'll just melt the first day. So uh, first I want to go over some uh, data from 2015. And let me set this slide up for you. Um, blue bars are pre-emergent herbicides. Red bars are post-emergent herbicides. And in this study, we did a weed-free check where um, we didn't apply any herbicides, but we physically went in and hand rolled those plots um, and took out the weeds. And then we did an untreated control where uh, we just let whatever weeds that came up stay in the plot with the hemp. Okay. So on the, on the axis here, you have percent phytotoxicity. That's a fancy term to say how much injury, crop injury occurred. So the higher the number, the more uh, crop injury the hemp uh, exhibited. So here in Bowling Green, um, some of these uh, pre-emergence, pentamethylene, uh, metallicor, all right, peroxysulfuron, and did pretty well. Uh, we didn't see a whole lot of damage on the industrial hemp. Uh, Mesotrion, pre-emergent, did a great job at controlling hemp. <laughs> um, and then uh, the post-emergence, most of the post-emergence that we tried um, really um, deemed the hemp. Uh, Bermoxamil did not so much, but Bermoxamil doesn't control very many weeds. It's a very old herbicide chemistry, and same as MSMA. MSMA um, was real safe, but MSMA just kind of targets grasses and doesn't do a good job at controlling broadleaf weeds. We replicated this study in Lexington, um, there at the at um, uh, the University Farm, right outside of Lexington in the UK, and so we had the same treatments. But notice in Bowling Green. The pre-emergence showed little phytotoxicity on the hemp, but in Lexington, we see more phytotoxicity with pre-emergence and a little bit less with the post-emergence. Anybody want to hazard a guess why that might have occurred? Okay, so we got different soils. All right, different weather, but the weather was about the same for most locations that year. But the other big difference was it's two different cultivars. And so that started raising some flags with us. Um, we started wondering, hey, are you gonna get different um, herbicide responses if you're having different cultivars of industrial hemp? Okay. All right, so just some pictures uh, from that study. Um, I think this might have been one of the mesotrion pre-emerged plots. It did a great job at controlling hemp, obviously. Um, other plots uh, look Fairly decent, you can see some phyto on this plot here. Okay, I and mean, we've seen that picture before. So um, the next year, um, we focused on pre-emergence herbicides, and we looked at Prowl, Dual, Flexstar, and Command. And how this graph is set up is that each um, herbicide was applied at three different rates, a low, a medium, and a high rate. Okay, so all these are in order as you move across. This is the low rate of dual, medium rate, and, and high rate. Once again, percent injury or phytotoxicity is on our y-axis. So from this research, um, the pre-emergent herbicide that was given us the least amount of phytotoxicity on industrial hemp was Prowl, which is the active ingredient's pendomethylin. Okay, a um, little more with dual, and then Flexstar, um, really um, almost 100% control of industrial hemp. So it was really, showed a lot of phytotoxicity with that product. Uh, command at a low level, not so much, uh, but command at this low level didn't do much on controlling weeds either. All right, this is the same data uh, again at, uh, at Lexington where we replicated the study. So it's set up again. Here we have, uh, this will be Prowl, Pendamethylin, different rates. 
all right, dual metallic core and a commands on the end here. Okay, um, there uh, we, again, the pendimethylin uh, did pretty well, uh, but uh, so did metallic core and some others. The uh, command or chromosome, again, showed uh, a lot of, of uh, phytotoxicity. So from this study, we kind of started targeting in and looking at pre-emergence, uh, kind of like Prowl or Prendimethylin might be our most safest one uh, for uh, industrial hemp. Okay, so uh, 2017, um, we looked at, um, sorry, it's catching up. Ooh, boy, it's going fast. <laughs> we try to go back. Right. So we looked at just looking at uh, pre-emergence versus untreated, and the pre-emergent herbicide here was Prowl, and we measured hemp height uh, after uh, emergence throughout the growing season. And so um, here in 2017 and 2018, um, early on, uh, pre-emergent herbicides did stunt uh, the industrial <coughs> hemp. So we noticed that um, the plants seem to be slow uh, by putting down uh, pendimethylin. Sorry. But at the end of the year, uh, we also took overall biomass of industrial hemp. And so by the end of the year, there was no difference between treated and untreated with the pre-emergent herbicide in 2017 and in 2018. And so um, even though these bars are a little bit different, they're not statistically different. And so what we saw is, is that early on, the pre-emergent herbicide uh, did stunt uh, industrial hemp. But if you have an industrial hemp that has a longer growing season, it tends to grow out of it after a period of four or five weeks, and it'll catch up by the end of the year. All right. So uh, some take home uh, messages from, from our work. Um, hemp has a zero good tolerance to buttrol, MSMA, and the group one herbicides, uh, fusillade. Uh, these are herbicides that uh, fusillade are grassers. They take out the grasses. Um, do not do much on broadleaf weeds. Uh, fair to good tolerance to the, um, the herbicide group 15 for pre-emergent. You may see reduced stands. Uh, you may see early on stunning um, in your crop if you utilize those down the road. All right, uh, but the most important thing that we can do to help control weeds is get the hemp up quickly and try to get the ground covered as quickly as it can with that canopy. So soil moisture is going to be an important role, um, soil temperatures as well. All right, so uh, later on, uh, if and when, um, some of these herbicides, especially pre-emergence, might become um, available for applicating on hemp. You more than likely, you might want to go at a little bit higher seeding rates if you're going to use some of these pre-emergent herbicides. Okay. Again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Williams at UK and Rich Mundell and Leo Black, who's also helped us in the past. Um, our Graduate students here, uh, Brett, Robert, Ryan, and Dr. Gilfields is our soils person. Um, obviously, all the help with the KDA, and Atala Holdings and Andre Shavati have also been instrumental in this research by providing seed. So, do we have any time for questions, yes. David? All right. Go ahead. Uh, those group 15 herbicides that you talked about, like dual and Zizua, do you use those as a pre-emergence? But like in a row crops, we always also use that as post-emergence herbicides. If you do anything over the top, I'll okay. out those are metabolized in the plant. All right, so the question is, the group 15 pre-emergence, like dual and Zizua, did we, uh, they can also be utilized as post-emergent over the crop herbicides. And the question is, do we utilize any of that, um, or do we try those applications with our, uh, with our 
research trial? And the answer is no, we only use them as, as pre-emergence. So, um, you know, most of these pre-emergence, um, the idea is, is that um, hopefully your seed is a little bit lower in the ground than where your pre-emergent herbicide is going to be. And so when that seed germinates, that root radical is below where the herbicide is in the soil so it doesn't get taken up. And then weed seed that are laying on the surface, and a lot of our weeds need sunlight to germinate, and weed seed that are laying on the surface, um, then when they germinate, they do take, take that herbicide up. So um, uh, that would be a good question for Dr. Willen. Um, my initial thoughts is, is that I don't think it would have changed much of the results. Um, because if you do apply them on the soil surface, um, you know, post, uh, post emergent, I don't know how much extra root uptake they would they would have. So, um, but that's something that maybe we should look at. And if you see me this afternoon, I'll get you in touch with Dr. Will and he can answer that question for you. One more question for Dr. Will. Yes, in the back. In the 2015, the Bowling Green and Lexington used different cultivars. Yes. They were different both years, yeah. So the question was, in both years, were the cultivars different there at the UK, our site at UK and here at this farm? And that, the answer is that is true. So um, along that line, I'll close. Uh, you know, this year, uh, we're going to try to uh, plant, as, and if we got any people that's got seed and want to give us a uh, shameless plug, but if you want to donate some seed to our research project, we would really like to have as many different cultivars as we could possibly have and plant those and then do a large shootout trial with all these different herbicides so we can identify uh, which ones um, may be more affected by pre-emergent herbicides versus others. My hunch is, is that some of the lower growing types, uh, some of that germplasm that came out of Canada and the lower growing, we like those because they go through the combine easy. Um, are going to be uh, more susceptible to these pre-emergence than the taller growing ones because the seeds are just longer and they got longer time to grow out of them. But I don't know that for a fact. That's just kind of some initial observations. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very much.